most fans are fans of teams or if you have you know old player coming back like double if for example then you know everybody super hype if he's coming back you know that's sick uh other than that yeah i think you know just based on you know what type of content you're viewing and as as someone who's been playing league for as long as you have um kind of tell us about what your your kind of i guess impact is on on everything that that's kind of developed over the last many years with league um you are someone that has become a, an identity a, a face of a lot of teams and of a lot of communities uh i think a lot of people really do respect the the impact you've had uh both on nalcs as well as on a lot of teams namely uh, clg 100 thieves and FlyQuest most recently what my <clears throat> what my impact is you want me to talk about yeah uh yeah it's a hard question to answer i i just do what i can you know for most teams uh usually most of the time a lot of guys don't well i usually have to help people learn concepts you know while we're playing the game and practice or whatever where it's you know how to play as a team most of the time so usually that is what i do and what most of my guys know me for i would say just being the calm level-headed guy you know make the tough decisions during the game stuff like that so uh other than that just i guess since the beginning helping the well i was there with the support role was just absolute trash as well <laughs> being able to uh overcome that you know getting paid just super low wage out here with wards and all that no items and moving on to where supports pretty much run most of the games like if you can affect the map you're probably the most important player early game into late game being able to snowball your team and stuff like that now supports have you know a much more defined role and i was there since you know forever so being able to be a playmaker and not just you know the little ward bot it's pretty been pretty awesome that actually really leads me into kind of one of the next topics and, and something that i'm personally really interested in um you have been there for multiple generations of of players and of teams kind of coming and going um what are your kind of perspectives on on how the players in the lcs and the the way in which teams and organizations carry themselves in the lcs uh, how has that changed over over your career uh in the beginning it was more player focused i would say players had the power in uh, the orgs where you know whoever was going to be on the team uh who you wanted to play with how the team was ran usually the players were self-coached we didn't really have coaches back in the day either so that was the dynamic and then over time it started swapping towards more org orgs having the power you see them you know paying all these guys massive salaries and stuff like that you know i benefited you know at least a couple times throughout my career from all the uh investors coming in for certain orgs and stuff like that so that was pretty cool uh and yeah people have come and come and gone i think a lot of uh players definitely some players i don't want to say ousted just left early i would say retired a little bit early when i think you know they could have played a lot longer they had a lot more to give but you know just didn't work out for them uh other than that yeah it's a big revolving door for most teams obviously it's hard to keep your spot but uh the guys who do stick around for a while you know it's good to see and definitely helps teams grow because i do think it's, uh, some most teams definitely need veteran players not a lot one or two is totally fine just to help smooth things over because you definitely need you know some sort of pillar that you know is stable consistent and then while you know your other guys learn around you and hopefully you know you can build a team style around that so uh yeah nowadays like there's nobody really left obviously you know double came back bjergsen came back from retirement as from coaching and yeah that, that's all i can really think of wild turtles and academy yeah i don't know not a lot of us you you mentioned some players who who retired early or, mm -hmm. or left the league pretty early um 
to to my eye as someone who who watched pretty pretty closely from 2012 to 2016 or so uh it felt like a lot of players left when there was this that shift from the player focus to the org focus where mm. players realized uh they could make more money just doing content yeah do you think that some of those players if they had stuck around would have continued to kind of be those veterans that 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 you became oh uh, yeah of course uh, a lot of the guys that played early on in the days obviously learned League of Legends, the ins and outs, everything macro wise. And really, the only thing that does change is like the micro champion mechanics, items is pretty much it. So, yeah, I do wish, you know, I could still be playing against those guys or, you know, with that would be pretty cool. But uh, it just happens like that. But uh, in terms of veteran veterancy yeah it's hard to get the right kind of guys you want because you definitely want you know really high mechanic carry players who you know can hold their weight and then most of the time it's always the support player who's going to be the veteran most most of the time and then usually you want your type of frontline player as well so usually you'll see those guys around the scene for a while uh other than that i mean yeah that's pretty much it are there any of those kind of older players that they left kind of early and, and you wished you could have played with? Uh, I did play with one. I would, The only one that comes to mind is Chouster. I thought he was really good. Uh, when I first joined CLG, he was on the team. So yeah. he was, you know, double of support <laughs> at the time. And then I came in and they made, they had me play support and then Chouster move roles to jungle. But he was just really good at the game. Like he could play any role. Uh, I do think his main role though was playing mid lane once he we had him sub in one time, I think, because I forget what happened. Somebody had to go do some real life stuff. And then when he played mid for us, it was just like, oh, my God, this guy's insane. Like he was playing against Reginald at the time, who was the best. And I was like, dude, he's just holding his own, you know, running, making calls and stuff like that. I was like, wow. So, you know, sucks to see him leave. I really enjoyed learned a lot from that guy, too. So I'm probably biased, but, you know, it's fine. (laughs) So I, you've said that the, the league is, has changed. Do you think there were any kind of seminal moments that, that marked that change from a player-driven league to an org-driven league? Mm, probably when franchising came. Franchising? Uh, I think some orgs had some power. Like yeah, Usually the, like the main org, Cloud9, when they started you know, in the beginning... TSM, uh, who else? And CLG, I think it was like the main top three. Like those were started to be player driven at the beginning into the, you know, the first start of LCS. And then, you know, once franchising started coming in, then it was like, yeah, all the works have power pretty much. So I think it was just that, that moment. Kind of follow up on that. Uh, how do you think that the league has has changed over the years obviously this that that shift from a player driven org to Mm -hmm. to a franchise driven driven league Um, but do you think that the the way in which those those teams and the league as a whole have carried themselves do you think that's that's changed significantly uh, for the better for the worse over the last 10 years change for the league uh i'm biased because i i was more i thought it was more entertaining when we had like road trips and whenever you know gaming can not gaming convention i guess gaming events like pax ipl iem and stuff like that were being hosted and then you know riot would partner not partner just team up with these guys to have our event there so i thought that was probably the most interaction I would say I would have with, you know, fans, uh, being able to experience an event like that hype around the event, you know, uh, it's pretty fun. Uh, obviously going to, you know, big venues and stuff like that is so cool, but I do, do enjoy the road trips and having that change to where, you know, it's only in Santa Monica now for a regular season. Uh, that was at least a bit of a downer, you know, uh, obviously I wish, 
I wish I could go around into each city because, you know, obviously not all the fans can make it out to Santa Monica. Sometimes, you know, they'll come out for playoffs or, you know, whatever venue there is, you know, that's cool. But I thought that change kind of kind of let the hype go down a little bit, but it's okay. Other than that, obviously practice has changed so much over <laughs> over the course of the LCS. You know, sometimes it's some splits. I don't know what's going on, but 10 a.m., wake up, 11 a.m., start practice, or they'll swap it, you know, will be 12 p.m. I think now this split, they're doing two whole blocks with the break in between again, where it's like the Korean style practice that they do over in Korea. So, uh, there's a lot of changes. Uh, obviously, when franchising came in, uh, I guess it's more job security for a lot of a lot of the guys. Where before, you know, you can just get dropped at any time. You can still have it happen now, but uh, with the players' union, that's what it's called. Yeah, with our players' union, it's a lot more secure as well. So thank thank goodness we had that coming in. And other changes. Yeah, I don't mean, I've seen a lot of a lot of team staff the, changing all the time. So, you know, don't see a lot of the uh, old faces anymore, but a lot of people are coming into the esports scene, you know, getting their first job most of the time or just helping work on, you know, the back end of staff organization duties, whatever it might be. That's cool. So. You mentioned a couple of things that I, I, I'm going to definitely get back to. Um, one being the players union. But uh, I, with all the changes, one of the things that's been been happening, at least to, to my eye, has been the the way in which audiences engage with league content has has changed a lot. Where mm-hmm. those those older events, the IPLs, IEMs, they you had a handful of these events all year which would draw huge viewership and then the world's wherever it is pulling in millions mm-hmm. while the world's numbers have continued to, to go up year over year, the, the viewership because of franchising and moving to Santa Monica, having that studio, the, the viewership has, has dropped. How do you think that the, the changes that, that you've mentioned have kind of impacted the, the enthusiasm for the player base and, and their, their interest in both the game and in league or in, in LCS. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think if I was, you know, a fan of a team or a player, I think it was most important is you just figure out who you're actually the fan of. And so obviously when, you know, your favorite player stops playing, or, you know, whatever might happen moves teams, either you follow or you don't. So a lot of the old guard is gone now. And all I can really think about is like a lot of us back in the day, we we're all streamed most of the time. Like it was easy to, you know, hop on Twitch or whatever it was, Justin TV back in the day, watch our stream, you know, learning League of Legends when it was first coming out. And that definitely built a lot of the, you know, hype. I guess around, you know, players and stuff like that. And then over time, you know, you get attached to teams, whatever it might be. And nowadays you don't really see a lot of people streaming in general. It's mostly team content or you'll see them on LCS with uh, the LCS content that they do. And obviously it's a lot harder to build that sort of connection. So that's why most, I don't want to assume, but I think most, most fans are fans of teams or if you have, you know, old player coming back like double it, for example, then, you know, everybody super hype. He's coming back, you know, that's sick. Uh, other than that. Yeah. I think, you know, just based on, you know, what type of content you're viewing. And I do think every year it's always talked about like, yeah, there needs to be more content around players. You know, you want to get attached to these players, learn about them. And I do think Riot's doing their best in terms of that. Uh, I know this year, I think this year they're obviously, well, not obviously, this year they're going in the right direction. Uh, I thought bringing on cutie uh, Cinderella mm-hmm. for the broadcast was <laughs> super awesome. That was actually so funny. Wow, her interview and doing a little baking stream with Speaker that was pretty cool. And then I know FlyQuest hired Ovly for their team content, which should be good. I really enjoy you know Ovly on the broadcast uh, and right before. Uh, so yeah, they just gotta you know they're going in the right direction right now. 
they just got to do more of that because yeah. a lot of us it's I've experienced it where it's hard to stream nowadays in the LCS because my whole day is, you know, practice review. And then most of the time you're pretty tired after that. You don't really have the energy, you know, to interact or you'll do no cam, no mic stream, stuff like that. And so it's a lot more difficult. Yeah, actually, we, we had overly on the on the show on Monday. Uh, and and one of the topics that, that came up was being able to tell stories and kind of spin narratives in the WWE or the, the LCS. The WWE, whoa. Oh, sorry. No, no, no. <laughs> man, my mind, I, I've I've been, I recently got into the WWE, watched my my first pay-per-view this weekend. So I've been. Oh, let's just, go. It's been all in. Let's um, go. But no, we, we were talking about that and. We also actually had Cutie Cinderella on last year, and and mm. when one of the audience members asked, like, "What's her goal for 2023?" was be on the LCS broadcast. Yeah, so she she was able to to hit that one pretty quick. That's dope. Um, kind of going back to that that idea of of storytelling. What do you think that Riot and the LCS could do better to kind of create those storylines uh, and and allow ways for audiences? to connect with the stories of individual players? Mm. Uh, well, like I said, right direction now with the uh, cutie. Hopefully, you know, she comes back on more. Uh, other than that, obviously it's tough, but you definitely need someone, you know, like cutie Cinderella who brings out, you know, the player's personality a lot easier. Uh, I know in general, it's hard to tell, you know, what players interests are obviously you know you have your journalists uh, you have travis gafford who has good player interviews in general you know asks mm -hmm. about their interests and stuff like that but uh, i do think it's more important that you know it's shown on <laughs> broadcast where you have players interacting i know whippo comes on as a caster analyst desk for that kind of stuff uh but what i do notice a lot let's say for instance lec like their players are always on the broadcast like it doesn't matter yes. you know who it is they're all over the place uh, it's very enjoyable to watch hearing their opinion uh you know either talk trash or anything like that so for lcs in general i would i would like to see them more as well you had mentioned the 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 kind of connection between fans being fans of a player versus a team and how you know in in the old days of lcs uh it was fans being fans of, of individual players mm -hmm. when when those players change teams those fans kind of move with them do you think that it's just that the the franchising and, and the added schedule that's that's led to that shift from players not being able to connect with the the or fans not being able to connect with the players as much and connecting more with the teams yeah i would say so uh org that comes to mind was like 100 Thieves makes so much content, you know, around all their creators. Uh, they had the heist when I was in the team for the players, which was, you know, awesome. But you don't really see those kind of reality shows with teams anymore. Because uh, all I can remember, obviously, is Breaking Point. <laughs> but, yeah, you don't really see that too much anymore. Uh, but following an org where they have, you know, all these creators who do different, you know, kinds of content, whatever, you know, they're passionate about is, you know, I would think pretty cool. And, you know, a big reason why, you know, a lot of people follow orgs and stuff like that. Yeah. Do you just kind of a, a quick follow up? Do you think that it's. Do you think that it's, it's sustainable in, in the same way that I think a lot of in traditional sports, most people just go to the team and, and, if their favorite player joins, great. If they leave, get angry, burn the burn the jersey. Uh, do you think that that the this kind of shift is stable? Do you think that it'll continue this way, where where people are fans of the teams, and when their favorite player comes, they celebrate. Mm -hmm. When their favorite player leaves, they burn the jersey. Is that stable? I mean. Uh, earlier, like I said, is like a revolving door. All the teams change in players left and right, so it's obviously hard to support uh, players because you don't know if they're going to be on a team next year. Maybe they're not. Uh, so you, obviously, it's a lot easier to try to support the team with uh, 
what they're giving, but sustainable, no, probably not. Obviously, you would like to have, you know, your, uh, what is the word, your franchise player on the, uh, on whatever team, you know, you're supporting for a couple years, hopefully, you know, try to build around that and stuff like that. But everybody's doing their best. Everybody wants to win. And NA in general, we haven't really done that well in an international competition in a long time. So, you know, you just got to try to figure out the right puzzle pieces. And if it's not working, uh, I do, I think the only team I do think that the only two teams was the previous 100 Thieves uh, iteration where it was Closer who he FBI and that core stuck around. So you definitely need a core on your team. So I do think having a core like that, very important to success. Uh, those guys play really well. They had you know immense pressure when they were together. Now they're split. But I think CLG is also doing the same thing where they have the same actual five players on the same roster, uh, ability and able to build synergy and stuff like that. I think it's hard if, let's say, you go three months, <laughs> you try to get this iteration to work. We're going to swap it again in the next three months where maybe one player stays and it's hard to get a good core that, you know, enjoy playing together, build the uh, cohesion synergy up. And I think having a good core also helps you in terms of, you know, being able to be fans of a team who are, you know, working towards a goal where it's not changing every three months. Uh, yeah. So. I know I was on CLG myself where we, we were together for a long time and, you know, build that type of cohesion. So I think that type of thing is very important. Speaking of, of CLG, uh, I was talking to Jacob about this earlier. And, and when we were going and doing a little bit of, of research as, as someone who kind of stepped away from league, I, I had to brush up on on what you've been doing for the last few years. Yeah. Um, and I realized that you are the only player of color to play in the LCS or in any of the, the major regions. Mm. Like I personally, I very distinctly remember when back then Zion Spartan, now Darshan mm. uh, joined in the league. And as an Indian dude in college, who was playing a lot of league, like I let my grade slip because I wanted to play more, get better. And, and Darshan really kind of inspired me to want to be better at league rather than just kind of, being bad, being mm -hmm. hard stuck silver. Uh, <laughs> oh man, I was I was terrible for a while, and and Tough, genuinely when 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 Darshan started, and I started being more kind of gung ho about like thinking about the game is when I rose up into high plat and then eventually diamond. Yeah. Um, what do you think about your role as the only player of color to to be in the LCS and and kind of what are your perspectives on the the lack of kind of that diversity within in professional play well first i, w I wasn't actually the only there was also noxiac and lcs or lec sorry oh, uh shoot, and yeah. then before lcs i think in like one of the lcs promo attorneys with uh bishu there was uh bobby hank hill another person of color uh there was also hood stomp so i know all the guys that were you know going up with me uh, those two guys that I said last didn't make it, unfortunately, but Noxiac was a support in LEC. I think he played for Fnatic at the mm -hmm. time, and he's now coaching some team, I forget. But, so, but now I think uh, I think in other regions, there's also a couple players of color. Uh, I can't re remember off the top of my head, but for L LCS, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm probably the only one. Uh, I think growing up, obviously for me, a little... I was playing basketball more than I was playing <laughs> uh, computer games, but obviously there was a switch when I was growing up where I started playing more computer games. It was like high school and stuff like that. And uh, I think I was just fortunate that, you know, my father is super gamer. Like when I was growing up, he had a PC. He was playing Starcraft all the time, Diablo. So, and then I got my own and I just, you know, pretty lucky because, you know, a lot, not a lot of uh, kids have access to that kind of thing. So can't really practice, you know, your computer skills. You're most of the time going to school, you know, playing sports and stuff like that, where, you know, getting a basketball a lot cheaper than buying a PC. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> that's what you can do. Uh, but I know the fighting game community in general, a lot of people of color over there, like those guys are monsters. And I think eventually, you know, it'll start getting a lot better where social media is becoming a big thing. Everybody's on social media, you know, playing PC games is now looked good upon instead of, you know, calling them a nerd back in the day. We're like, what the hell are you doing, bro? Uh, also anime, a lot of people are getting into, you know, all that's coming out and people are like, wow, this is actually pretty good, you know? So, but yeah, being the only person of color, eh, it's cool. You know, it's cool. Have you, think- have you ever considered kind of uh, trying to do any initiatives into increasing diversity within the league? Or, or in, in developmental leagues? Yeah, I think that would be awesome. Uh, I've never really done anything like that, but I know it, I would definitely be down to uh, do anything like that, whether it be, you know, with land centers, uh, hosting tournaments and stuff like that. You know, that's what I can think of at the top of my head, but I, w- I would enjoy getting into that. So, Afra, you have, I think, supported more players than any other support to my knowledge maybe i never really thought of that stat so <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I i looked through the the all of the big supports that that i could find and you were the one that you had 12 teams 17 adcs i think to my count mm. uh, and the next highest i could find was 12 with one of the korean supports i believe maybe it's core i don't know i think it might maybe have not. been maybe it's uh, core maybe but you have seen a lot of adcs a lot of of these these bot lane combos and you yeah. have consistently adapted to to the meta whether it's been ap bot lanes tanky bot lanes engage bot lanes yeah in in your time playing, has there been a meta that you just hated that you you just wanted to be done with and move on so you could get to the, whatever the next one is? Meta that I hated? No, I just hated champions. I would say. <clears throat> I think Anything bot lane. In particular? Oh, particular champions that I hated. I hated the uh, the uninteractive lane where let's say you're uh, Zyra, bro. Just spawns a plant and you're getting poked. Like, what is that, bro? I hate that shit. <laughs> it's so stupid. I'm fighting plants. Yep. I'm not even fighting a champion. So other than that, when Azir was first released as well, the so anything that like annoys me as a support. So when Azir was first released, his soldiers could kill wars over the wall. And you can't even do anything. It's interactive. So you put down a ping, boop, boop, boop. He kills it from like two screens away it's like uh, that is balance bro and then other than that is just anything that just impossible to play against like Kha'Zix when they gave him the stealth buff where he walks into a bush gets invisibility and so they had these little routes where you know it was the normal support warding route but Kha'Zix could just walk in the first brush and then be perma stealth through all the brushes and then out of nowhere I get one shot like okay guys uh, that's pretty fun and then when Zoe was first released, so it's a lot of on release champions. Zoe first released, one shotting me out of nowhere. That's crazy. And yeah, that's about it. Uh, I think playing with my time playing with a lot of 80 carries, uh, it doesn't really matter what the meta is. All that's important is, you know, being able to communicate. And I'm pretty, I think I'm pretty good at that. Just, you know, getting on the same page. Yeah, if we don't agree, being able to come to a middle ground with my 80 carry on what we want to do. And then just being able to support his play style, whether he's aggressive, whether he's more of a passive farmer kind of guy. And yeah, that's just one of my strong skills to have. And it doesn't really matter who, who my AD carry is, you know, I can acclimate to whoever. Before we had started the interview, you were saying that retirement doesn't really feel that different because you're still playing the game a lot. Uh, now that you, are kind of taking a single step back. You've 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 gotten one step past the this this retirement. Um, do you think you're going to be playing primarily league moving forward, or, or kind of what are you hoping to to do with your content and and with your your professional life? 
Uh, we'll be doing wa- watch party of LCS, that's for sure. Mm-hmm. I'll probably finally do my placements for this season. <laughs> uh, we'll see how that goes. Um, other than that, I love playing FPS games my whole life. Uh, I think my first actual, like, not my first. I mean, all, all of my games, I'm always PvP focused. But the most fun one I ever had was like Unreal Tournament 2004. It's an FPS game way back in the day. Oh. Love that game. So FPS, I love FPS. I'm like, I'm sorry. So I'm always playing a lot of Apex right now and Valorant in general. Uh, I do like Apex a lot more because of the fast movement. But in terms of content, yeah, probably be a lot around the watch parties and how teams operate, you know, what they're thinking here, uh, stuff like that. And then hopefully, you know, start playing a lot more with friends because usually I'm practicing most of the yeah. time. Uh, the only th- sad part about League of Legends right now, I would say, is what you can't duo past master. Oh, yeah. So that is probably the worst part about playing League right now. So, yeah, as I'm sure everyone else on my team would also agree as someone as people who have always been bad. That's we've never had to even think about it. <laughs> we, all, nice, we, all, bro. we all hit the, the wall at like high plat and then yeah. that's it. That's the Must end. Must be nice. Must be nice. <laughs> Dude, it's it sometimes it's really good to be really bad at something. Yeah. And that's what um, the legends. Fuck. And yeah, I, I definitely feel you on, on Apex. Apex is has rapidly become one of my favorite games to watch and play. The movement in that game is is fantastic. Let's go. Once Apex is gone, I'm gonna be so sad. No, Apex Apex can't can't go. Apex I has hope. to stick around. I, I haven't yeah. enjoyed an FPS as much as I've enjoyed Apex in, in a hot second. Big facts. Nice. I think, yeah, before that, it was Team Fortress 2. And before that, it was oh Unreal my God. 2004. Dude, I miss TF2 so much. Classic TF2 was an absolute fucking joy. It was... two, <sighs> two Fort back in the day. Oh, good times. Good Dude. times on, on my like 20 pound laptop from yeah. 2008 or whatever dude what was your class you played the most oh i was a, i was a dirty sniper player dude like, <laughs> I, I, I was i was the worst kind of person i sat oh up in two fort and i just sniped that's dope <laughs> i like that i played a lot of spy and medic oh love spy, spy player oh spy makes me <laughs> spy hurts me spy hurts me so much <laughs> Love that. So I think we're going to start taking questions in in a couple seconds here from from the audience. So before before we start doing that, uh, I had kind of one more, a little bit personal question. Mm. You. And it's been a while since I've seen this interview. I remember you talking in an interview, maybe in like 2015, 2014, around then uh, about giving back to your family and, and I believe also the community that you grew up in Mm -hmm. um do you have any intentions to to kind of continue some of that that charitable work and and try to be something of of an ambassador from the league community to to outside communities i think eventually yeah Uh, i don't really know how the logistics will work and stuff like that uh i used to stream a lot back in the day and you know do some content but i've never actually done anything like that so um, i'm probably just first time learning uh and yeah i i do think so uh this is my first interview i've taken not is this a podcast rather i've never actually been on a podcast i don't think yeah i don't think so so it's my first podcast i'm doing as well so a lot, a lot of first things for me usually i'm just on the grind you know playing yep. practice and stuff like that but yeah, I charitable, charitable work will be really awesome to do whether whatever that well whatever it holds you know i know from from our team thank you for being your uh your first podcast we're we're more than happy to have you <laughs> genuinely like i have had to hot push down the fact that i'm actually really fucking excited to do this <laughs> let's go because <laughs> i've been a, a huge fan of yours for so goddamn long so thank you i appreciate that um <laughs> Yeah, so I think we have a couple audience questions. Let me... Okay, so we have... 
Ventus official, Rebar- remarkable Matt. He's uh, actually an editor for uh, a Smash content creator that I that I know pretty well. Oh, he asked a question. He asked a question. Let's see if he accepts the invite. I'll give him a few seconds here to. to oh, do they come on it. in the ask it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh the, shit. Kind of the this is the kind of the fun thing about this this format and doing it on Spaces is the these people get an opportunity to ask some of their favorite creators and YouTubers, gamers, whatever. Nice. The questions that they have. All right, Ventus, you are ready to roll. If you can unmute, that'd be great. Oh, and uh, Afro, if you can turn your phone up because it'll come through your phone on this. Oh, oh, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, uh, so this actually does, it is kind of Smash related. Um, There's an interview with a pro player in Melee. His name is Zane. And he said something along the lines of like, one day I know this game isn't going, like it's not going to mean everything to me. So what's most important is like what I can get out of the game or like learn from it. And so along those lines, is there anything like as a competitor Um, from competing in league or just like being in a team like skills or things that you've learned that kind of translate to the person you are today or just like out of game in real life stuff in general yeah good question uh i would say how to talk to people i've learned the most understanding their tendencies, their demeanor, uh, how to realize, you know, everybody's different. Can't talk to everybody the same. Nobody, you know, understands solutions the same. You got to come up with a different type of solution. Uh, That's probably the number one thing that I have learned and gotten out of playing League of Legends competitively. And I've taken that to every team I've been on where, you know, there's really no one else on the team where you have someone who can communicate like that and, you know, bring people together. Um, sometimes it's the coach. Sometimes it's just me. And so I think I've enjoyed that part where, you know, I've worked with apparently over 1780 carries and, you know, I don't, I've, I've enjoyed my time with all of them. I would say. Okay. Okay. Um, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I remember you did an interview where you you referenced like the Haikyuu OVA, um, where oh, they're yeah. like, "Oh, you connect." It was the one uh, in between with Travis. Yeah, it was in between season three and four where they're like, "Oh, you're they're all the players are like connecting and synergizing." So, I, it, that really lines up with that interview. I also love Haikyuu, so uh, I like the connection <laughs> there. It's funny that your answer like really connects with that too um but yeah thanks for answering i appreciate it yeah of course thanks for the question all right our next question our next question is from christian 1334 i believe 13324 christian uh, if you're there go ahead hello hey zach how you doing Good, I don't know. Uh, so my question was, was there any team during your career or org that you wished you were part of? Any org I wish I was part of? I think I've been on most of them except Cloud9. I was on TSM before LCS, which was cool. Uh, yeah, I think only Cloud9. Probably when uh, Sneaky was playing, that would be fun. So I used to be doing with him a lot back in the day. And hey, we have one more question, or actually, I think we have two more questions. One from uh, Kathy Rin. Uh, Kathy, go ahead. It's also Kimiko, Kathy. I don't know if you remember me. I remember you. How's it going? It's going well. I hope you've been well. Um, Obviously, been a fan of you for a long time. And 
was always trying to send you like words of encouragement and like low moments and like celebrated celebratory moments and was wondering if there was any kind of words that you would have said to like your past self like to hey like hey celebrate this moment or hey like live in this moment and learn from this or any kind of words like that to your past self any kind of words probably probably hang out at the uh after parties a lot more especially when we won most of the time i, I was just so tired from screaming on stage i would just go to sleep right after but uh probably yeah, hang out with my teammates and uh just enjoy the moment because you know you're not really going to get that too often uh once you you know moving forward in your career and i think we have one final question from uh from robert kakarot slays okay uh no response from from robert so i will i will ask this last one before we uh before we end the interview what's your most f- memorable moment from your career most memorable moment Pro- obviously well for me is just when i won the first time a lot of hard work going into that leading up to it uh haven't won in a while uh was there when CLG was at the bottom of hell pretty much and then finally winning it all is you know very very awesome uh, definitely a surreal moment. I mean, going into that tournament, we knew we were going to win no matter what. Like, our practice, we're literally dominating everybody. I don't think we dropped the game. So, just having that type of confidence going into a tournament is unmatched. Like, it, it was awesome. Thanks for watching Visionaries on YouTube. For more content, please subscribe to the Overcome channel.